From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, Welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew. An apology from Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin for how he handled his prostate cancer surgery and lengthy hospital stay, the mea culpa coming in the secretary's first direct address to cameras. Since that news broke, we'll speak with former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. Progress meantime on an immigration bill inching forward. Senators saying they expect text of that bill before the weekend. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says there will be a vote next week. Invesco's Jennifer Flitton will be with us in studio. And the 2024 fundraising numbers are out. President Biden sitting on a pile of cash ahead of the November elections, dwarfing his opponent's halls. We'll dig through the numbers coming up. And we welcome you today with breaking news earlier from the Pentagon. We thought we might be hearing an announcement about strikes in retaliation for the attack on U.S. troops over the weekend in Jordan as Lloyd Austin approached the podium with a limp. Addressing the cameras, standing up for the first time since his hospital stay and prostate surgery, spoke to reporters on the other side of the Potomac. Here he is. But I want to be crystal clear. We did not handle this right, and I did not handle this right. I should have told the president about my cancer diagnosis. I should have also told my team and the American public. And I take full responsibility. I apologize to my teammates and to the American people. Joining us for more on this and our other top stories, Bloomberg's Nick Wadhams, Wendy Benjaminson, and Eric Wasson. It's great to have you all here. Nick, let's begin with you. An apology to the President of the United States and to the American people from the Secretary of Defense. Did he put this behind him today? I, you know, I think he did. This was all but inevitable after the Secretary waited several days to inform the president that he uh, had been hospitalized and then waited even longer to say that he had had uh, prostate cancer surgery. I mean, you can imagine what his response would have been if a subordinate uh, in the military chain of command uh, from his time as a general had done that to him. They probably would have been gone. And he, in fact, addressed that uh, today and said, listen, uh, essentially, I screwed up. Um, he then very quickly sought to pivot and talked a fair amount about the uh, impending strikes that you mentioned that the U.S. is expected yeah. uh, to launch really at any day against uh, Iranian-backed targets in Syria. So a dual message there, apologizing, but at the same time essentially saying, look, I am the guy for this job. This is a crucial moment, and we need to get back to work. Just for more on these impending strikes, he described them as multi-tiered. Uh, Nick, do we know anything else about the scope or timing of what's about to happen? I mean, we're, we're sort of in this extraordinary moment where the president has essentially completely abandoned uh, any element of surprise and telegraphed when in no uncertain terms that the U.S. is preparing to uh, d send these bombs over. The question is, as you mentioned, uh, how widespread they're going to be and where. But the expectation right now, I think, is Iranian-backed proxies in Syria and Iraq. Uh, there's a real reluctance to go after Iran despite pressure uh, from Republicans within Iranian territory for fear that that would essentially ignite a direct conflict with Iran. So this balancing act where the administration wants to signal that the killing of the three U.S. soldiers over the weekend will not be allowed to stand uh, while also trying to avoid uh, the very confrontation and, and broader regional conflict that President Biden has said for so many weeks he wants to avoid. Nick, great reporting. He runs our national security coverage here in Washington at Bloomberg. Nick Wadhams, we thank you as we turn now to Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson. Here at the table, Wendy, President Biden uh, is not in Washington today. He was wheels up to Battleground, Michigan, a visit uh, to Detroit for a political event. And, uh, and some more later on, I suspect that he would be able to address uh, the nation if something did occur tonight or tomorrow. But sure. the purpose of this trip to Michigan could not be more important for his reelection just a day after Donald Trump was addressing Teamsters supporters. Right. Uh, they're both fighting for the same votes in this state. How's Joe Biden doing? Well, that remains to be seen. However, he has the endorsement of the UAW leadership, the United Auto Workers leadership, uh, for his support during the strike. Sean Fain, the president of the UAW, is 
very opposed to Donald Trump's candidacy and talks yeah. about him in, in pretty stark terms, um, and so is endorsing Biden. Well, that's one vote. Then there's the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of UAW members who don't always go with their union's leadership on who to vote for for president. The UAW endorsed Hillary Clinton in 2016. She didn't campaign very much in Michigan. Donald Trump won Michigan in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2020, Biden did win Michigan, and he's looking for a repeat there um, this year. So he is, I think, take, learned that, you know, or knows that you have to go to Michigan. You have to spend some time there. It is a must-win state. Yeah, that's right. um, and so he's going to try to pull those auto workers into his vision for the future. He's talking about the economy, of course, but we've learned in our own polling and on the ground. Wendy, you were there with us in Iowa and New Hampshire, mm-hmm. that immigration, the border, the overriding issue for Republican voters and a lot of independent as they debate a deal here in Washington, this is something that he's begun speaking directly to. Right. And he can do that in Michigan, too. That issue, because it's been all over conservative media you know, every single day, mm-hmm. it has become a top issue. And that is something that he needs to address even in Michigan, which is on the you know, Canadian border, um, as much as he does in Arizona. So I think he will probably try to address that. And he's going around the country, of course, to raise more money um, for this re-election. And we started this conversation talking to Nick about the tensions in the Middle East, what might come next. He's been dealing with uh, a real backlash from progressive voters, in many cases Arab and Muslim American voters, right. who will be speaking to as well in that state. So many of these stories cross over in Michigan. Yeah, yeah, Michigan really is ground zero for a lot of this. There is a very large Arab American, Muslim American population in Dearborn, Michigan, and in Detroit, and he needs to um, quell their anger. Um, as they are being uh, exhorted to stay home Mm -hmm. or to vote for somebody else um, over his policies in Israel. Today, he signed an executive order imposing sanctions on Israeli citizens in the West Bank, the settlers in the West Bank, Mm -hmm. who are taking up arms against Palestinians who claim that land. And so we are actually, the U.S. is actually imposing sanctions on Israeli citizens. That is the first move that Biden has made to tamp down some of this anger about his very um, strong pro-Israel policy so far. Let's see if it connects in the polls. Uh, As usual, the question we're asking here, Wendy Benjaminson, thank you so much for being with us. Republican Senator Tom Tillis speaking with reporters earlier about that possible deal on the border. Here he is. With the passing of time, the the hill gets steeper. I think that what Senator Lankford has negotiated has not been characterized properly, uh, that it is good policy. But I do believe if if you don't get out and uh, and overcome some of the objections, that it's it's absolutely at risk. We now bring in Bloomberg's Eric Wasson, who's been reporting from the halls of Congress. And lucky to have you at the table, Eric. It's good to see you on Balance of Power. Uh, We know that the Speaker of the House says it's DOA. We know that there are objections from Republicans in both chambers, yet negotiations continue. Are they at the table in vain? I don't think so, necessarily. I mean, they're they're getting very close to finally having a deadline. Chuck Schumer set a vote deadline of next Wednesday, February 7th, Mm -hmm. to to actually move on this in the Senate. And that's important. Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader, is saying, you know, Chuck, you've got to set a deadline. People are not going to come to their final positions until we have a timeline. And, uh, you know, the real feeling among Republicans who support this is that Donald Trump and Republicans in the House are mischaracterizing the deal, saying it would allow 5,000 illegal immigrants, uh, undocumented immigrants, into the country per day. That's not what the deal says, from what we understand. Uh, You know, it would allow the president or mandate the president to shut down the U.S. asylum process if there's a certain threshold that's met. Uh, So they want to get this deal out, probably come out on Friday, and then start examining it and start defending it once it's made public. Well, it's interesting because it hasn't been. We don't have text yet. We understand it could come out as soon as tonight. Uh, Will that help? the conversation because all of this has been essentially based on rumor and media leaks. I think I think it will actually, you know, and it will help uh, Langford and uh, who's James Langford of Oklahoma who's negotiated this get out there and really get in front of this where he's really had to sort of, you know, fend off these attacks. Um, but then it's really going to become up to Speaker Mike Johnson and the House Republicans decide what they're going to do. And Mike Johnson does support Ukraine aid, but he's in a bind because he said the border has to be secured first. Now the former president, presidential frontrunner Donald Trump is saying no deal that's not perfect. So it's, it's, it's going to make some very tough, tough decisions in the House. We'll see a vote next week. 
I, I think we will see a procedural vote yeah. in the Senate. Uh, you know, whether the senators try to block that and negotiate for more time remains to be seen. Great reporting again from Eric Wasson. Thanks, Eric, for joining here. Coming up on Balance of Power, we're going to talk more about Secretary Austin's extraordinary news conference this morning with someone who's had the job. The former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta joins us next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I think that we need to make sure that whatever lapse in what we thought was standard operating procedure to inform the White House, his boss, uh, and key members of Congress, we need to tighten that up to make that an expectation. On a personal note, I had prostate cancer. Um, and I know every person's different, but when you're in a leadership position, uh, you got to lead by example. And one thing you need to do is not be ashamed of prostate cancer. You need to tell everybody that's over age 40 to get a PSA test and take it seriously. It's the most survivable cancer uh, that exists today. So, but you know, I know that I, I can, I can. Uh, uh, for the man, Lloyd Austin, he can choose whatever he wants to. But when you get elevated to that level of leader, you got to lead, and then you got to get out of your comfort zone. Senator Tom Tillis reacting to Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's admission today that he should have handled his prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment differently. We spoke to the senator just moments after the briefing at the Pentagon. And for more, I'd like to welcome the former U.S. Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, someone who's held that job before and brings unique perspective to our conversation. Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you. Uh, the optics here were interesting, and we knew in advance it's the first time that we'd be seeing the defense secretary standing in front of cameras in such deliberate fashion since he got out of the hospital. As we've shown our viewers today, he limped a bit as he got onto the stage, but he seemed to be in strong voice uh, and spirit. What did you make of his presentation today? Well, look, uh, <laughs> I, I think as we all know, it's, uh, it's a rare thing to have a leader in Washington stand up uh, and acknowledge uh, a mistake uh, and apologize. Uh, but he apologized to the president and he apologized to the American people. Uh, and I think it was uh, it was the right thing to do. Uh, you know, he, he, he assumed full responsibility for having made the wrong, the wrong choices here and not informing uh, his, uh, his leader. But by doing what he did today, and speaking out publicly and apologizing openly, uh, I think he's got a better chance to put all of this behind him. You heard Senator Tillis a moment ago, and we've heard this uh, from others on both sides of the aisle, that this event should prompt new protocol uh, in terms of handling something like this. Do you agree, or, or is it simply about following the protocol already in place? Well, it, it, it depends on uh, the particular administration. I, uh, when I was chief of staff, we had a protocol that required uh, cabinet members uh, to tell us exactly where they were. Uh, and I believe that they've put that kind of protocol in place now at the White House. Uh, it is important that when you are in a leadership position, particularly as Secretary of Defense, where you are uh, in the chain of command, when it comes to all military issues, uh, there is no question that uh, if you're going to be out of touch for whatever reason, that uh, you have to inform both the president uh, as well as the key national security advisors there in the White House so they know where you're at. Many assumed he'd be talking about military strikes uh, when this news conference was added fairly late in the morning. It took place at 1030. We didn't have a lot of notice. And the secretary did go there. Lloyd Austin talked to reporters about the response to the deadly attack in Jordan. Here's what he said. In terms of uh, telegraphing about strikes and whether or not uh, uh, people uh, leave or would have left, you know, I won't speculate uh, on, uh, on any of that. I would just tell you that, uh, you know, it, we will have a, a multi-tiered response. Uh, and, uh, and again, we have the ability to uh, uh, to respond uh, a number in a, a number of times 
depending on what the situation is. Multi-tiered, uh, Mr. Secretary, is about as detailed as he got, but there is reporting from CBS News that it would not be direct strikes against Iran, rather Iranian personnel and facilities in Iraq and Syria. Is that the right approach? Is that what you expect to see? Well, I, I think what's important here is that uh, three United States soldiers died uh, and lost their lives. And so it is absolutely essential that the United States provide a strong response uh, in sending a message that this cannot happen again. So I can't tell you the parameters of what that response looks like, but you'll know it once you see it. If it's a strong response and goes after those who were responsible for killing American soldiers, uh, then I think uh, the administration will have taken the right steps. So we'll, we'll just have to see exactly what kind of steps they have in mind. There are some concerns about overstepping, of course, about escalation. Secretary, we heard about that today from Senator Elizabeth Warren speaking to us in the halls of Congress. Here's how she put it. We're really caught here. Obviously, it's important to defend Americans and American service members all around the world. And our heart goes out to those who've been lost. It's also important not to pour gasoline on a smoldering fire. So, Leon Panetta, how do you hit Iran hard enough to make a point without escalating this into a new front or a new war? Well, you always walk a fine line between uh, deterrence and escalation uh, and war. And, um, and yet it is extremely important that uh, we send a message that American soldiers are, their lives uh, cannot be taken uh, by whoever the adversary is. So we've got a situation here where we're dealing with proxies, but we all know that Iran is involved in supporting those proxies. Uh, I hope mm -hmm. that whatever targets are selected, that those targets make clear that we are holding people responsible for this attack. That's the main message that has to go out. Would you expect strikes tonight? Uh, you, you don't know. I mean, uh, this is not this is not exactly a secret anymore that there's going to be a strike. No. Uh, but uh, regardless, uh, I think that uh, we have to respond, and I would hope that we would respond quickly. Well, you make a great point. What is the purpose of telegraphing this to the extent the Pentagon has, or are these leaks going to news agencies that should not be? I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I do worry that uh, sometimes when you talk about it publicly and say you're going to do it, that uh, it kind of uh, tips off uh, the very targets that you need to go after uh, and gives them uh, some capability to avoid uh, whatever strikes we're going to make. So. I hope they've taken that into consideration. If they're going to take the time to strike targets, they better, they better be damn sure that we are going after those targets uh, and making them understand that they have to pay a price. It's good to see you again, sir. Thank you for the insights on what could be a very important day here in this whole saga. Leon Panetta with us, making a great point that this began with three American lives being lost, three Americans in uniform, and so we say their names. Sergeant William Rivers, Specialist Kennedy Sanders, Specialist Brianna Moffitt, that's why we're talking about this today, along with the more than 40 troops who were injured. Coming up on Balance of Power, Nikki Haley facing an uphill battle as she prepares to face former President Trump in South Carolina. We have new numbers, and we'll talk about that next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. But chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Chaos follows him. 
And we can't be a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive. Republican presidential contender Nikki Haley talking with voters in South Carolina today. Thanks for being with us on Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington here on Bloomberg TV and radio. A new poll out. We've been waiting for this for weeks. Since the last credible poll dropped showing a 30-point spread, it's not getting much better. This now showing Nikki Haley trailing former President Trump by a wide margin in her home state. The site, of course, of the next major Republican primary contest. Joining us now to dig into the numbers for a moment, Bloomberg opinion columnist Nia Malika Henderson. First of all, welcome to Bloomberg. I'm so delighted it's to so have you at the table. I, I can't imagine what you're making of these numbers because January 5th was the last kind of credible poll out of South Carolina. And today, as we learned from Monmouth University and the Washington Post, 58 to 32, essentially the same spread yeah. following Iowa and New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Are voters trying to pick a winner, or was just this was already a losing state for the former governor? You know, in so many ways, nothing really has changed. I do think folks in South Carolina were looking to New Hampshire to see if she could keep it a right. little closer, right? It was about 11-point uh, spread. I was talking to some folks in South Carolina before that a race. They were disappointed at mm -hmm. those results, and so now you have uh, a race that's sort of frozen in place with the former governor of a state now trailing badly uh, to Donald Trump. Listen, I'm from South Carolina. South Carolina is Trump country. Yeah. He has remade the Republican Party in his own image. And now you have uh, Nikki Haley likely on the losing end of that. Listen, she never thought she was going to win. She thinks she could keep it close. She has this whole idea of just gaining by each you know, state. Yes, so she's right. at 43 and maybe she can get uh, 45 or 47 percent. And some of the folks I talked to on the ground said maybe that would be a high watermark, 47 percent. But if she lands at 47 percent, you know, after we're seeing these polls at 32, that would be something of a victory. But it's still okay. a win. So is this the just hang on strategy in yeah. case something happens to Donald Trump or does she hang in this race as long as the money lasts? You know, I think that's that's right. Like the, the old saying in politics is, you know, the, the money is what makes mm -hmm. folks uh, d drop out of races. And so we'll see. She was down in Florida, hat in hand. Uh, she had about 20 billionaires and millionaires asking yeah, right. them for donations. Some of her campaign folks are doing the same, mm -hmm. making the argument that Donald Trump is a drag on the Republican Party, that not only would he lose, sure. but he would drag down the whole, t uh, you know, party down Take it's got it three as well. weeks, I guess, yeah. to make that case. We'll see. I'll be down there this weekend. Don't be a stranger. Yeah. All right. It's great to have Nia Malika Henderson with us here at Bloomberg Opinion. Coming up, Jennifer Flitton of Invesco will be with us here on Bloomberg. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Dare to dream. The House of Representatives passing a $78 billion business and child tax break bill last night. It actually happened. A rare moment of bipartisanship. Look at that number. Again, 357 to 70. With us now, Jennifer Flitton, head of U.S. government affairs at Invesco. What a pleasure to have you at the table, Jennifer. Good to see you. Uh, you look at the way this broke down. Look at this overwhelming vote. Conservatives on the right were unhappy. Progressives on the left are unhappy. The definition of compromise. And you start thinking, maybe there's, maybe there's a chance something works here. And we wake up this morning to headlines that this may not be able to get through the Senate. The tax deal, the, the, the best thing Congress has going. Could it pass? Yeah, it does seem to be the perfect recipe, right, for finally breaking through and providing some bipartisanship yep. in in Congress. Um, I think 357 to 70 is a really strong vote. So heading into the Senate, we've yet to hear from Chairman Wyden, who's mm -hmm. the Senate finance chairman, who has jurisdiction over the issue. Mm -hmm. We've yet to hear which direction he wants to take this, take it directly to the floor, provide a markup for members to be able to amend. Um, I think we have to wait and see That's what, what those comes committee out members that. want, right? That's exactly they what wanna, they want. They want to tinker with this bill, which could slow it down or kill it. Right. Typically, the Senate is used to pushing things down the throat of the House. It's not usually <laughs> Yeah, the other how way about around. that? <laughs> so let's just try to play with the calendar for a minute here. Even if they like this bill, uh, we've got a two-week recess coming. Yep. We've also got what appears to be a, a, an impending impeachment trial 
for the Homeland Security Secretary, which would take a couple of weeks, I'm guessing. Does the calendar allow for this? Yeah, so you're right. The Senate is in session next week, and Schumer has already announced that whatever defense supplemental comes out of, of this announcement tomorrow mm -hmm. when the draft drops, that he wants to bring that to the floor next week. So that's going to take up the week next week. That's your potential border deal. Right. Check that box. Exactly. Yep. And then we move into a two-week Senate recess. Mm -hmm. And we're now approaching the end of February. We have this appropriations deadline, right? Yes. I mean, we need to get a lot done in a very short period of time. You don't sound that optimistic that that's possible then. Uh, I, I know think... you want to say nice things, but uh, yeah, I, think I can go dark very easily on all of this. <laughs> I have to warn you. So a month from today, are we going to be shutting down the government? I think they will be able to find a resolution. They've agreed on those 302B numbers. Um, that really allows them to go forward into the individual appropriations bills and, and make some tough decisions on policy writers as well. Uh -huh. uh, so I think we're headed towards an agreement, um, but they have a real tight timeline here in order to do it. Once again, right. there's no time to play with. So this becomes another potential continuing resolution, which to my count, I think is the third since Mike Johnson said he vowed to never entertain one of them. You've got Marjorie Taylor Greene standing by with a motion to vacate. This could be an interesting uh, beginning of March if he goes there, the same week the State of the Union will be taking place. Right. Will he still be Speaker? Well, and that's just it. I mean, I, I'm looking at all that is coming down the pipeline mm -hmm. and thinking that we're looking at early March on, quite frankly, possibly all of this. This could be one giant omnibus that we're headed towards. Um, if not, then they uh, need to pass a CR and they need to do it before April 30th because that's when that 1% cut comes into play. A giant omnibus? The, the last guy got fired for less than that, right? Isn't that's... That's poison for Mike Johnson. If that happens, is he sitting behind Joe Biden at the State of the Union? I think that's the big question right now. But it only takes one vote, and he can't allow that con to continue over hanging over his head in mm -hmm. order to make decisions as to what is best for the conference yeah. on the House floor. You mentioned this uh, potential border deal. We hear text could emerge as soon as tonight. Mm -hmm. Once people get their hands on this, how does that change the conversation from one that's been pretty toxic lately? Yeah, not only do they get their hands on it, but they, they take it home with them, uh -huh. right? Because they're going to be gone over the weekend, and they're going to be back home, and they're going to hear from constituents. And we're going to see this play out, I think, on those Sunday morning shows <laughs> as to what next week is going to look like. And you've already heard from Senator Kennedy, who has said, we can't play this out on the floor next week, right? We need time to read this. Now, Senator Langford has said it's around 200 pages. Um, that's going to take a little bit of time to get through that policy. Most of it is the border policy. Yes, sure. It's already uh, been surrounded by misinformation, leaks to reporters, many of which may not be true. Are lawmakers going to be grown up enough to actually address what's in print? Well, and I, I think there's going to be a lot of debate on the, the actual text. Yep. So we're going to see what is actually in there. And there are going to be experts from all around Washington who are going to weigh in with these senators mm -hmm. um, on the practicalities of what this language could mean for the border. You've got people on the phone at Invesco who want to know what this means for the investment community, of course. And I can't imagine how you answer them with this level of uncertainty right now. What level of risk are we bringing to the markets when we talk about government shutdowns, not a fiscal cliff this time, but just total chaos, the inability to pass a law. Yeah, you're right. Certainty is what the markets want. Certainty is what our clients want. And so we try to really break through the noise that they hear, the rhetoric mm -hmm. from each side, some of the manufactured crisis, and get to what actually matters and what is practically uh, possible. And so that's what we're constantly trying to aid our clients with as they make decisions throughout the week. Uh -huh. Those decisions are pretty hard to make when you don't know what's coming next or if you don't know who the leadership is going to be. And now you add an election cycle on top of that. Um, is this going to cause investors to pull back? Well, hopefully, through the course of this year? Yeah, hopefully not. I mean, historically, elections, um, no matter which side mm -hmm. we, we see the presidential, whoever is in the White House and whoever is the makeup, uh, whichever party has the makeup of Congress, right? I mean, you see that markets uh, continue to move on and long-term investors continue to make money. And we try to remind our clients that and our clients' clients. So what's the biggest risk? Before you came in here, uh, we were talking about potential strikes in the Middle East, a standoff yeah. with Iran. Is energy 
what should be keeping us up at night? Oil prices? What's your worry? Right. Well, I mean, geopolitically, I I think there's a lot of concern right now. And I I think that's why we're looking to this defense supplemental. What is in the realm of possible? Does that lower uncertainty if that actually happens? Well, you see $60 billion go to defense? uh, Well, no, and and even more than that, right? Because they've added additional funding due to the missiles uh, that they've expended in the Red Sea with the Houthis. So um, that is going to allow for us to fortify our defense if we're able to get this um, money for just not just Ukraine, but Israel for the Indo-Pacific, right? And to to get our own stockpiles back to where they need to be. Um, This is really important. That's why you see Senator um, McConnell on the floor almost every day now talking about this issue. And a lot of lawmakers in states where these defense contractors are based, I'll be deeply curious to see if they can get through a border conversation to do this kind of business. But I'm sure you're waiting to find the same. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Sharing insights today on Bloomberg. Our thanks to Jennifer Flitton. Head of U.S. Government Affairs at Invesco. Coming up, which candidate pulled in the most campaign contributions? The end of last year, it might not be who you think. Our political panel will dive into the dollars next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Fourth quarter campaign finance disclosures are out. The filings are open. And we're learning who gave to whom and how much each money, how much each candidate, I should say, uh, has on hand. President Biden sitting on a lot of it, by the way. We're joined now by our political panel, Maura Gillespie, founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies and Alvin Jordan of Rock Solutions. Easy for me to say. It's some eye-popping numbers here uh, I'll tell you, more. you look at the amount of cash that Donald Trump brought in versus what he spent. Mm -hmm. Brought in $200 million. He spent $210 over the course of the year. This is all of the committees and the campaign put together. $50 million of it spent on lawyers. Is he going to have a money problem through the campaign? Because he's bleeding cash right now. Absolutely. And I think for the Republicans that are running for office, that are looking to win over the House and take back the Senate and things of that nature, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, increase the majority in the House, they've got to be frustrated, too, because not only does Donald Trump suck out all the oxygen in the room, he's also taking all the money. Um, He's not out there looking to campaign with them. He's demanding full loyalty from Republicans who are running for office, any office, really. And then what do they get in return for that? Uh, So I think it's pretty interesting. And, you know, after the E. Jean Carroll uh, trial, you know, we we know how much money he could potentially have to spend. Uh, And there were fundraiser emails coming out from people like Ronnie Jackson out of Texas saying Republicans are losing in the campaigning to Democrats. It's not even close. Uh, We need help. I mean... Things are getting a little it's, desperate. It's really something when you consider, Alvin, Joe Biden reserving $250 million in ads for the general election campaign. I don't even know where you find that much inventory, mm-hmm. but he's ready to spend, and he's got the money. As we learned in the last 24 hours, his affiliated committees, along with the DNC, raised $97 million in the fourth quarter. They start this year with $117 million in the bank. Now, if Donald Trump's here, he's going to tell you money doesn't matter, right? <laughs> he's the king of earned media. But what does Joe Biden do with this cash to make it a real advantage? He spends it. (laughs) I mean, he has to spend it where it matters Mm -hmm. also. And I think that's what we're seeing. I mean, even today, we saw him start the day here in D.C. at the prayer breakfast and then hop over to Michigan. And he's ending it in in Delaware, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, just with everything that I think he faces from, you know, kind of border to national security all the way to um, funding for the war. He has a lot of ground to either secure or to make up. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as evident by the amount that he spent also in the fourth quarter, the last three months that, I, um, no pun intended, that Trump the first, uh, you know, handful of months of the year uh, by way of his spending shows us that they're going to put that money to good use and I cannot blame them. Yeah. For, well, I'll tell you, it's interesting when you look at Uh, who some of the biggest donors included. It's not uh, just the folks that we've been talking about. It's Hollywood. Mm. You see this? Steven Spielberg and Kate Capshaw, his wife, each gave $929,000. George Soros is on the list. Eric Schmidt, Shonda Rhimes, who created Grey's Anatomy. Is that not a narrative that Donald Trump can seize on here and say, look, I've got $35 checks from real people, maybe spending them on lawyers, but that's what they want him to spend it on. (laughs) 
And that to me is kind of, again, shocking because it's not for anyone else but Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's been very honest about where that money is going. It is to save himself, not to advance a majority, not to advance Republican principles. It is just to get back at people who try to put him in jail. I mean, that's really where, where he, his focus is. And those hard-earned dollars that he is taking from, um, from middle America, from the people who believe in him, it, it, does, it harkens back to you know, the 2016 election when he said, you know, I could stand there on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone yeah. and they would still love me. I mean, he is just showing us that time <laughs> and time again, the power that he has over those people. And to me, it's really sad and it's abuse of their, their support and their trust mm -hmm. uh, and... Again, for a self-proclaimed millionaire billionaire who needs their thirty, their thirty dollars, their thirty-five dollars here, or there to to fund his legal bills, yeah, it's pretty sad. I want to ask you both about South Carolina. We were talking about this with Nia Malika Henderson a short time ago. Not good uh, look for Nikki Haley with a few weeks out. This is almost a thirty-point spread. Still, is the Republican nominating contest over? Joe Biden is acting like it is. Well, I mean, if we look back to uh, New Hampshire, it seemed right after that they declared both, you know, from the Biden camp and the Trump yep. camp that the election, at least for them, had started. Mm -hmm. And I don't <laughs> disagree with that. And I actually thought that um, it would be uh, it, not in poor taste, but a, just a terrible look for Nikki Haley to go and then also have um, her home state kind of, you know, yeah. not go in her favor. Um, but it seems that, you know, people there still, I think, back the, the thought of her coming mm -hmm. uh, home, essentially, right. to see if she could, could garner some more votes. And we know that she obviously is in it for the proverbial long haul, yeah. um, whatever that looks like now. But I don't necessarily know that it, uh, outside of making Trump spend more of that money, I don't know sure. that it necessarily is, is helpful. I well, wonder way. if that might be a strategy for, for somebody here. But look, an embarrassing loss at home could really change the dynamic here. We can talk about it in advance. Mm -hmm. You don't really know sometimes till it's over. Could she do irreparable harm to her reputation to run again in 28, for instance, if she goes through with this and gets wiped out at home by Donald Trump? I don't think so, because, again, the landscape that we're faced with as a Republican Party is, is just so tough right now because a large chunk of the party is unwilling to look beyond Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do anything uh, when you can't see beyond him. Again, the man is getting up there in age. I am not wishing anything poorly on the former president, but it's a matter of just reality that we have to grapple with, that he will not be around forever. He will not live forever. And so this moment <laughs> needs to be it's addressed. It, it's, it's, you know, so for her, I think she stays in it because who knows what will happen. Uh, and, you know, again, she's right when she continues to say on the campaign trail that a majority of the American people do not want to have a rematch of 2020, yeah. although that's looking like what we're going to have. But I think for her purposes, she's staying in it because the alternative is, is simply <laughs> Joe Biden versus yeah. Donald Trump, and they're running so that the other one isn't president. So it's not great for all of it's us. It's the whole, who knows what could happen strategy, yeah. Alvin. Mm -hmm. Isn't that Dean Phillips' strategy? <laughs> sure, but I, I, I think the... I don't know. I think it's important to kind of take a step back, and I think you raise a great point in the sense that it is not good for the American people when both of the, at least seemingly, candidates are running to stop the other one, when neither are the uh, opinion or true pick of the actual, you know, American people. And so, um, again, I think we're just kind of caught in the crosshairs, and the money will need to be spent that they both, you know, have. I tell you, there's going to be a lot of commercials. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Coming up, President Biden campaigning in Michigan today. We're going to talk more about the purpose uh, of that trip with our panel next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. President Biden making a campaign visit to Michigan today for those of you on Bloomberg television. Welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew on Bloomberg TV and radio. Of course, Michigan, one of seven swing states that could determine the outcome of this presidential election. We turn to our panel for more. Maura Gillespie and Alvin Jordan are back with us. Battleground Michigan, Alvin. You've got Joe Biden with the endorsement of the UAW, shared a stage with Sean Fain, 
Just last night, Donald Trump, though, is speaking to Teamsters members, knowing that the rank-and-file union members voted for him, not Joe Biden. How important is the union vote here for the self-proclaimed most union-friendly president in history? I think it's important on two fronts, actually. I think it's important for the simple fact that, um, as you mentioned, the endorsement doesn't necessarily carry the actual votes of the people. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking back to the first iteration of this matchup between Biden and Trump, the vote was very, very close. And I think that this just goes to show, number one, that every vote matters. Yeah. But then, two, I think just the influence of, you know, not just unions, but when we start talking about automakers and some of these um, specifically, you know, in the Midwest. Uh, I was in Iowa around the caucuses, and yeah. that wasn't so far in from the conversation that was happening there. And I think that, uh, you know, kind of what happens in some of these places, namely Michigan, um, for this particular conversation dictates a lot of the thought and the kind of, you know, following the, 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 the line, if you will, the party line, if mm -hmm. you will, from a union standpoint, mm -hmm. that actually trickles throughout the Midwest just outside of Michigan. And I think Biden understands that. So it's not so much the scale of membership. This is a symbolic I believe so. I believe so. I think the endorsement on its own is like check one, right? Yeah. But then we actually have to activate the people. Uh -huh. And I think that that was maybe some learning from the first uh, uh, run at this that, that the Biden administration took and are trying to rectify the second time around. Well, Maura, we want your take on this. Listen to President Trump, uh, former President Trump, at the Teamsters headquarters in Washington yesterday. You know, it's interesting. We just had a meeting with the Teamsters and one of the biggest problems they have is millions of people are pouring into the country. And that's a killer for the Teamsters. And I'm going to stop it. And that's why the Teamsters, I think, support me. Now, I don't know if the top people will support me. We're going to have to find that out. But within the union itself, I have tremendous support. So there he is talking about the border. Of mm -hmm. course, not a big shock there. But I wonder, what's a, what's a stronger, more powerful message to union membership? Is it Joe Biden walking the picket line as he did, wearing a union T-shirt, or is it Donald Trump saying yesterday he would absolutely block Nippon Steel's deal to buy U.S. steel? It's a matter of do they believe him or not, right? And I think Adam brought up a good point. You know, it's one thing to do an endorsement. It's a whole other game to get people out to the, to the ballot box, right, to get them out to vote. And, you know, Trump is already touting that he has squashed this, you know, border deal. He, yeah. you know, look what I can do without even being in power. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you believe him? Do you trust him? Uh, and I think that that's a conversation that voters are having. And they look to their union to get some guidance, because when we're talking about an uninspired electorate, uh, you know, we, the people, are the ones who are, you know, we lose in that scenario. But we're also lost. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people who maybe, you know, we talk about independence and we don't, we consider them to be moderates. We're wrong in that because what independent now means is that they don't identify with either party and that doesn't mean that they're in the middle. That means that they just don't know where to go and it's super important to look to something to say, okay, where should I be going? And so for unions, having this sort of a, a team, a, a membership, yeah. uh, you're going to go there first and try and pare down, okay, what is the better of two terrible options, sure. to be honest? Well, that's where no labels comes in, right? That's the lane that gets Democrats pretty worried. Well, I, I just... I agree with all of the last part of, of what you said in the sense that we really are playing for, and I think we even saw some of this uh, in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. the proverbial middle is really just the where should I side. I am not necessarily drawn. And so I think that's exactly what we are watching in real time play out as far as Biden actually having a presence mm -hmm. in Michigan. It is too secure those votes that are kind of dangling in the in the no man's land of it all. Yeah, absolutely. I f suspect we're going to be seeing a lot more of him. Will he not repeat the mistakes of Hillary Clinton when it comes to... He has the money. He has the money. <laughs> and likely already up on the air. $250 million. When does Donald Trump start putting cash into this or just he won't have any? He doesn't really have to. I mean, he, really, he doesn't have to. He gets attention mm -hmm. no matter what he does. He's showing up at court. He shows up and he makes everything that he does a campaign opportunity. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it's Again, it really does derail any messaging efforts that the you know House Republicans, Senate Republicans want to do. Yeah. But he doesn't have to spend a dime to do that because he knows he'll get the attention for it. Earned media. Earned media. That's turned a mug shot into a coffee mug. I Here mean, we go. What, exactly. I mean, what the T-shirts were right. all over New Hampshire, weren't they? Yeah, there you go. Maura Gillespie and Alvin Jordan, a great conversation. We thank you for the insights and a great panel here on Bloomberg. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online.
And I'll meet you back here tomorrow. We thank you for joining us on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Bloomberg.